Thank you so much for sharing this stage with us. This is an honor. Like, we are excited to talk about the Bible with you. We love talking about the Word of God, and so this is a lot of fun for us. Yeah, we're so honored to be at the table or the plastic table with you guys. As fellow Bible nerds, hopefully you'll embrace us as fellow Bible nerds. Uh, we could just kind of jump in. I think people want to talk about God and the Bible. I mean, the chosen, everybody's excited about, who's excited about the Lord? Yeah. It's round. It's round. Oh, it's round. Oh, there's a round table. There you go. That's good. We're on the table. <laughs> Behind it, uh oh, we're gonna operate on you guys. All right. So I just want to jump That's into so my favorite scene from The Chosen because I feel like it just really captures so much about what I think everybody loves about The Chosen, but definitely what we love about The Chosen. And it's the scene with the woman with the issue of blood. And her you, being healed. You had some audible awes on that, bro. I know. Like. They're, they're, they're saying yes. So, I mean, even if it's not your favorite scene, that's okay. <laughs> There's so many good scenes, but I feel like it, it captures so much. And so what I just want to ask you guys is this question of, you know, this is this presentation. You know, the Chosen talks about the authentic Jesus, right? Yeah. They love to talk about the authentic Jesus. So as Bible scholars and Bible nerds, if you will, yes. like how has Chosen done at portraying uh, an authentic Jesus, the, the accurate Jesus. I think people want to know, right? There's all these images and history and uh, who Jesus is, what he's like. How have they captured the authentic Jesus? And I think it's important that we want to hear from each of you. Like we, we introduced you because we want to hear from each background, right? We want to hear from the Messianic Jewish background. We want to hear from the evangelical background, the Catholic background. So with that in mind, maybe... Rabbi Sobel, will you just kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I love about The Chosen is that more than any other production, it has really captured the Jewishness of Yeshua, its Hebrew name, Jesus, and of the Gospels, which I'm so grateful for. And I think the restoration of that is absolutely so significant. You know, it says in Matthew 13, it says in Matthew, what can a scribe who understands the kingdom of God be compared to? Like a householder that brings forth treasures new and old. And for too long, believers have settled for half an inheritance. Yes. Wow. And the full inheritance is the old and the new coming together. It's the Gentile and Jew Come on. coming yes. together in the Messiah. Yes. And so we're very, very, very grateful for that. And I think it's significant because it helps us see the Bible in high definition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for example, when, you know, historically when people read the account of the woman with the flow touching the hem of the garment, they're like, oh, he just touched the corner of his robe. Right. But no, he touched the seat seat. He touched yes. the ritual fringes that were commanded in the Torah, representing of the 613 meets vote, 613 commandments in fulfillment of a prophecy that says the son of righteousness will rise up with healing in his wings. Yes. The word for wings is the same word for the hem of the garment, the corner of the, uh, the confei, uh, Arbach on Fot in Hebrew. So there's so much of that. And then it ties into this prophecy in Zechariah that talks about how in the day of Messiah's return and the establishment of the kingdom, 10, uh, ten, ten uh, Gentiles were grab the hem, the seed seat of the garment of the Jew and say, come, let us go up with you. Yeah. And so it's actually a sneak picture of that unity in the Messiah. And so I love how the chosen brings us together. Yes. That's so good, so good. Yeah, doctor. Yeah, I. one of the things I really love about the chosen is it's making us read our Bibles yes. with the correct yes. imagination. Yes. Um, the, the, the New Testament was written in the first century to people that knew first century culture. Some of us are far, some of us are far removed. <laughs> from the culture of the first century. How old are you, Jason? <laughs> I look good for my age. Just ask my kids. 
So here's a, a woman with a flow of blood, nicely sanitized in our New Testaments as we're reading right. it. We right. don't really understand the cultural baggage that that brings upon this woman. And uh, for us to understand, oh, the, the Bible actually talks about people's real problems. Yes. Yes. Like this was a woman's real problem. She wasn't just sick physically. This was a social problem. Yeah. This was a problem for her in worship. Yeah. This was a problem for her interacting with other people in day-to-day -day society. This was a, an issue of terrible shame. Yeah. And I think The Chosen is helping us slow down and read the Bible the way it's supposed to be read with that understanding. Yeah. So I, that's one of the things I really enjoy about it. It's like a, she has a multi-dimensional issue that affects every, every area of her life, and Yeshua addresses all of it in, in, in one instance, which is just beautiful, amazing. I love that. Yeah, Father, please. I, I agree with what... Um, my brothers have just said, and you know, I, I'm not sure that the first century when Jesus lived would have looked exactly like this. But I think what the series represents is a truth about the way that we, we know about Jesus. One is that um, people came to know Jesus through per very personal encounters, yeah. like the encounter yeah. with Veronica. Right. And then people came to know Jesus by sharing their encounters with one another. I love the scenes when they come back from mission and they're sharing the stories of how Jesus had worked through them. And I think um, that's a definite truth of how Christ is known, through personal encounter, through shared encounter that's then shared with other people. And then, uh, and this, in, in, with, the, with the storytelling of cinematography and great writing, opens up a new way to envision that's based on solidly on the past, but it feels very contemporary. And I love the scene with Veronica because I think she represents everyone who has some secret in their heart, in their soul that they feel shame about, that makes them feel isolated or separated or lonely from, up, from other people. Yeah. That Jesus could see that and that could heal that and that the power of faith can transform that and bring someone back, back into unity with the community. And boy, do we need unity in our community right now. That's amazing. So good. I love that, I love that what you said was that it, it, it touched the individual, but it was also a part of the, the, the larger community. And that when they came back, they're sharing their individual uh, experience with the king, right? But then it, it, it affects the larger whole. And like you just said, how much we need, we need this individual reality with the Lord. We need a, a personal relationship with him. And yet we also need this. We need each other, yes. right? Because it's first and second commandment. Yes. So I, I love what you're saying. Thank There's you. something really interesting and encouraging there because what they were were witnesses giving a testimony. Yeah. And the Hebrew word for testimony is the word aid. It is two letters, I and Dalit. And it's those two letters also can mean, uh, can also mean again, ode or aid. They share the same letters in Hebrew because a testimony is something God wants to do again and again and again. And that's the power of the of the narratives of the gospels and the accounts that we read. It's not, yes, it's something that historically happened, but the power of it is, is some, that, that testimony, that witness is something God wants to do again in all of our lives. And I think that's part of the power of the chosen that people can encounter that in that way. In, in a sense, it's reproductive. Right, it, it, it keeps going and it, and it, and it uh, affects others as we share with our testimony. And it builds faith that he can do, if he did that for you, he can do that for me. And it's a story worth telling over and yeah. over and oh, over yeah. again. Yeah. And by the spirit that we can share, even if the story comes from a different cultural background or a, you know, some other kind of different background. Yeah, oh, that's good. Oh, yeah. yeah I feel like the, the healing was how it was portrayed, like you're bringing in all the aspects of yeah. that, that scene. Uh, and I feel like that moment is so powerful. Like my immediate reaction was, wow, if Christians throughout the centuries, I want to see what you have to say about this, uh, Rabbi Sobel, like, Christians throughout the centuries would know this, like, see the Jewishness of Jesus. Like, you see the Jewishness of Jesus 
when she grabs his tzitzi. Like, in that moment, it's like, wow, I feel like now the chosen, like the Jewishness of Jesus has gone out to the four corners of the globe. Like that scene, I feel like, honestly, it's, maybe I'm overstating because I'm a little dramatic, but. Wait, 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 wait. But I, I feel like it, it will change Jewish Christian relations even, because it's like, wow, this is, this is who Yeshua is. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's I think it's very significant because I think it's restoring something that's been lost. There was a decision, we won't go into the history, but there has been a stripping away of the Jewishness of Jesus and an exclusion of the Jewishness of the disciples and, and of the Jewish followers of Jesus historically. And you know, for example, uh, I'm not sure how the, the Passover lamb became the Easter ham. That's, that's a mystery I'll have to ask the Lord when we get to heaven. <laughs> you think Yeshua would come to your dinner? <laughs> but, but I suppose. That's also a good bride. <laughs> right, so, right. Come on. You know, but, but I think part of that, you know, or like, for example, you look at the famous picture of Da Vinci. And at the Passover Seder, they're eating fluffy loaves of white wonder bread on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, <laughs> which the matzah being unleavened, pure, striped, bruised, broken, he chose that for a reason because it symbolized what he was going to go through for us, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But I also think there's something more, which is that I feel like part of it is, yes, for the believers, but yes, part of it to the Jewish world as well because I think that it's kind of like, Jesus is literally the son of Joseph and his, he fulfills Joseph as a type. And the, when Joseph's brothers came down to Egypt, they didn't recognize him because he walked like an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian, wow. right? Oh, I gotta pause, that's amazing. I'm, I'm stealing that, I'm totally stealing that. That's amazing. And it wasn't until he took off his Egyptian garb and Armin, he said, Ani Yosef, I'm Joseph, that his brothers recognized, wow, this is our brother. And in many ways, we've made Joseph an Egyptian. He's unrecognizable to the Jewish people. And so I think what the Chosen does is help him to become more recognizable, which is, I think, important. Yes. Okay, it's so good. Any other comments on that, either for, from either of you? Well, um, I don't want to steal your thunder, uh, <laughs> but uh, this goes all the way back to the, the book of Genesis, chapter 12, um, with Abraham getting the promise of God, saying, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to give you a land and descendants, but in you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Yeah. I mean, this is part of God's design for salvation, is to bring all the nations of the world, all the families of the earth will be blessed because of a Jewish boy um, named Jesus. I really love that the chosen throughout the series has woven in the Psalms, which were totally clearly a part of the spiritual formation of Jesus. And uh, in the Catholic tradition, still are such an important part of Liturgy of the Hours and the, the liturgies that we have. And so it's been wonderful to see them prayed in context yeah. Yeah. and reminding of their, the way that they, they come from a Jewish context. They speak to the Christian heart even to today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I just wanted to just say one thing, which is that I think that as we look at what's going on in Israel, in Gaza, you know, in the Jewish tradition as well, the Psalms are central to prayer and devotion. Yeah. And so I think praying the Psalms over what's going on in the Middle East, what's going on in our world today is something that's really significant. As you said, something we see modeled in The Chosen. Yeah, yeah that's so good. I've, I've actually been doing that just this last week. And it's amazing how relevant the Psalms are for right now. <laughs> like they're just, they're so old, but so relevant. Yeah, and it, it's, it's true because uh, we've, I've been doing a daily reading of the Psalms, trying to do it morning, midday, evening. And so 
it, it, especially recently, this week, it's been like every song is like echoing what's going on yeah. in Israel right now. And you're like, I know how to pray this better because of what's going on. And it, it, it becomes highly uh, relatable, but also effective as intercessory, you know, intercessory prayer. And what Lord, Lord, do these things. Or, or sometimes there's also, there's David saying stuff and you're like, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable saying that. <laughs> But, like, he's a man after God's heart. He knows how to pray. Yeah, I was reading that in Psalm 45. It says, in your faithfulness, annihilate your enemies, basically. Like, whoa, it's like there is, it's intense stuff, but it's amazing how relevant it really is. If you like our videos, you should. (laughs) Please make a donation and help us spread a biblical messianic worldview. One of the things I feel like the chosen, uh, does so well, I'm like echoey, hello, hello. You're good, just keep going, just push past. Push past. <laughs> With this Jewishness of Jesus, is it, just wanna connect the dots that it, it actually presents the humanity of Jesus. Meaning, he's God, man, right? Fully God, fully man. So I think a lot of times we see him as God, but then what the chosen is doing so well, and, and, and thank you, yeah. Gentlemen, so much for bringing this. Well, I think we love the chosen because he's so relatable, yeah. yes. right? He's so human. Right. Yeah. But what that really means is that we're presenting this first century, second temple Jewish Yeshua. And I think that's what hadn't been done. And that's partly why the chosen is so successful because it's like, oh, wow. It's so authentic. This yeah. really could have been what he was like. Right. And then you feel like you're getting to know who he really is. Does anybody feel that way? Yeah. Like, so I'm just curious on like how this has been portrayal because it's, do you guys have that sense of the relatableness even as you're consulting them? I mean, what does it even look like as they're consulting the chosen, right? I mean, what? Well, is this an email? Like, uh, or is it a, a, a text channel? It's a text thread. It's a it's a text thread. No. Yeah. That's not really a question in there, is there? I was like, well, I guess I'm wondering how was this intentional? I mean, like, did you did you kind of see this going into it? If we could just present this authentic Jesus, he'll be so much more relatable. Was this part of the goal or, or did this just come out in your dialogues? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, it was a great up when, before The Chosen was even named and I was asked to get involved and took Dallas and some of the crew to Israel. Um, it was always the desire before the scripts were ever written, and I know you all can jump in on that, that that would be a key part of what they wanted to bring forth, both the humanity of Jesus, which is like, I'm grateful that he's not some ethereal, yeah. otherworldly, sure. he doesn't, he's just here physically, but he's not really present at all, some distant stare into like heaven, <laughs> um, but also bringing the Jewishness of him, which is I think, you know, both of those are so, so powerful, he's so relatable, and yet he's, in his context and you know one of the things that I I think that's often been overlooked is that he is the son of God he is the son of man but we also forget that he's Ben David he's the son of David and so we think you know there's something wonderful about the incarnation and that's as great as the crucifixion uh, that God forever took on a human nature and forever brings together divinity in humanity, which is an amazing thing. He forever maintains a human nature, even to this day, which means he identifies with our pain and suffering and everything that we go through, he can understand because he went through it. But then there's also the fact that he didn't come as generic humanity, He came in Jewish flesh and blood, a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and ultimately a descendant of David, which means he, yes, he he ties himself to the fate of humanity, 
but he inextricably ties himself for eternity to the fate of Israel as king of the Jews, as a descendant of David, which is, I think, significant that the chosen helps underscore. Yes. Well done. I, I think of three principles when I talk with people about the chosen, um, three principles that operate uh, in the scripts and uh, as the show comes out, uh, authenticity, they're trying to tell the story of Jesus as we have it written for us in the New Testament. Uh, plausibility, uh, when you move from a written text to a visual, audio-visual medium, it, there's blanks that have to be filled in. Sure. We don't know what color of robe Jesus wore, but he's got to wear one in the show. <laughs> With the blue sash, right? So, so let's have it be a plausible color for the first century Jewish world. It's not going to have paisleys and stripes on it. It's not going to be polyester. And, you know, um, so authenticity, plausibility for the things that we don't know. And then that third principle, this relatability. Yep. I think we've become, like I said earlier, we've become a little too far distant from our reading of the Bible. And we, we forget that these are real people and the chosen is trying to bring the reality a little closer so that we can all relate to that story a little better. Uh, the, the New Testament book of Hebrews talks about Jesus um, suffering everything that we've suffered, uh, gone through humanity the way that all the rest of us have only without sin. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a significant thing that's being presented in The Chosen. Yeah. I had a spiritual director who used to tell us that you can't be a Christian, a believer in theory. It always has to be rooted in a real experience of the time and place that you are. And I don't know that we've, I, going back to something that Rabbi Sobel said, I don't know that we've always really appreciated the, the incarnation. Mm -hmm. That God who's transcendent became very specific. Yeah very imminent to people and the chosen just reminds us of the ways that happened the first time and in the in all the ways that Dr. Hubman talked about but I think it's also a reminder too that if we are to encounter Christ it's not just in the theories that we know and the theology that we know but in the very specific concrete encounters that we have with Christ and Christ and the in Christ people that will really come to know the real Jesus and that the, ch the Chosen's really helped so many of us envision so, what that would look like in Jesus' time, but also more of what it, what it looks like in our own time so that we can see it, celebrate it, and try to live it. Yeah, yeah I would uh, offer you this challenging thought. Um, Jesus Christ is more human than any of the rest of us. Wow. Okay, unpack that, come on. <laughs> It, it, always, it always makes me wince when somebody says, ah, uh, to sin is to be human. Oh, no, no, no. To sin is anti-human. Adam and Eve were human before they sinned. That's right. And sin went against their relationship with God as human beings. Jesus is fully human and fully God but more fully human than the rest of us because his humanity is unspoiled by sin, whereas the rest of ours is. Imagine this, we had a big barrel of apples here and every apple I took a bite out of had a worm in it. Oh, I guess apples have worms. Uh, oh, this apple has no worm. It must not be a real apple then. Throw it away. No, no, that's the best apple. That's the real apple. That's Jesus. He's the real apple, unspoiled by sin. Yeah, I just got saved. I just got saved for sure. That was, and and, and, wow. and building, he's the only 200% person. <laughs> Come on. Right? I like that. Can he's I take that one? Yeah, he's the only 100% human, 100% divine. And I, but I think there's a misconception that I think it's important, as you say that, to underscore with both of you. And, and I... And, it, and I love working with both of you because you have such amazing insights. I'm always blown away like, wow, that's a great thought. I, it's amazing. <laughs> and, uh, but one of the things is I think we tend to think, well, when, he, when we read passages like he was tested in every way, like, well, it must have been easy for him. See, actually, it's the opposite. Right. Because he was perfect and without sin, what that means is that, you know, 
there's a Jewish joke, it goes like this, it's like, Jewish people are like everybody else, but even more so. <laughs> but that's more true of Jesus. He's like all of us, but even more so. So what that means is he felt pain more deeply because he wasn't fallen. He felt things on a level that we can't even begin to understand. And so when he was tested or when he was rejected, because his spiritually and emotionally, he wasn't fallen, it was deeper than what we could ever understand, which is something that I think is so beautiful. Again, that he, that's a big part of the sacrifice of the incarnation. Yeah. Yeah. The only 200% person, that was good. Everybody, everybody take that one home. <laughs> well, let's uh, shift a little bit. Uh, I mean, we have this amazing diversity. I wanna just point this out on the stage, right? We've got a Messianic Jewish rabbi and a Protestant scholar and a, a Catholic priest and- And they all walked into a bar. <laughs> Because you guys have never heard that before. Yeah, I know. First time. That was the first time that joke's ever been said to these guys. We tried to see if we wouldn't say it. We tried not to say I it. Think, I think I can go. Am I good? Am I done now? Sorry, Tom. I, I derailed that question like crazy. I like the, the priest, the pastor, and the rabbit walk into the bar. <laughs> and the rabbit says, I think I'm a typo. Uh, Money's worth. Come on. <laughs> Two good memes and a joke. Yeah. It's, it's a great takeaway. <laughs> I haven't so, heard that one. <laughs> so we have this this diversity, and like one of my favorite principles in scripture is unity with distinction. It's this biblical theological term that actually uh, describes the triune God, that he is uni completely unified, but there's diversity within the triune God. And it's difficult to understand and it's mysterious and all this, but we as the family or the body of Messiah are a reflection of God, right? We're image bearers. So here we have this on stage and, you know. I'm just gonna say the yeah. phrase one more time just in case anybody missed it. It's unity with distinction. Right. Yeah. So maybe, maybe write it down, because it's, <laughs> so, it's so good. So the chosen is very ecumenical, right? It's not presenting a Catholic worldview. It's not presenting a Protestant worldview. It's not presenting a Messianic worldview. It's, it's the chosen, right? It's, it's this ecumenical presentation of the scripture, right? And so, and yet there's this unity. I mean, even in your relationship, you've watched enough Bible roundtables, you can tell that there's a unity in your relationship. You guys right? seem to like each other. Right. Yeah. It could be a, at least on the surface. It could be false. It could be completely false. He said, I'm not bad for a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, we have the distinctions for sure, but there's a unity here, and so, whenever we start talking about unity, immediately you get the haters, right? Yeah. And the haters say, oh, well then you're watering down the gospel, right? We talk about unity, it's the first thing people say. Oh, well, you're watering down the gospel. So well, my question for you guys is, is that your experience? Is that how you guys are encountering your chosen, quote, experience? And then in addition to that, I want to say, how have you seen the chosen bringing unity in your spheres? Because yeah. this is extraordinary in some sense. And so I, I want to really go there. Yeah. It's a great question. I, I go back to the Gospel of John where Jesus said, says that uh, my prayer is that you be one as you, Father, and I are one. The, the prayer of God is that we be one and that we find unity. 
And I think it's where you look for unity. If you look at for unity in what we wear or particular cultural ways of doing things, it's going to be harder to find. But when you find your unity in Christ, that's something to, that's a place where of encounter, that's a place to build, it's a place for dialogue, to speak the truths of the distinct, you know, the distinctive parts of the faith that we represent. And um, I think that's so important. And what The Chosen has done is, I find so many people in the Catholic tradition and other, and other people that I encounter in my life, that it gives us a common story to talk about again. Yeah. Well, yes. We're talking about The Chosen, which really we're talking about Christ, the apostles, the early church. And it, again, this is a unifying way for us to have, begin to have a conversation about the most important thing. So you're saying, if I want to make sure I'm hearing you right, mm -hmm. you're talking about the Catholic world that you're involved in, right? Right. That you're finding the chosen is helping, like how would you describe that from this, this Catholic reality? I mean, to me, I'm yeah. really curious about that. I, I think that, uh, there's there's so many Catholics that love the chosen, and, and still every week I'll be outside after mass, and somebody will say, "Father, have you heard about this this series called the Chosen?" <laughs> yeah, I don't know something about it. Yeah, <laughs> tell me what you're. <laughs> and we're talking about the scenes. You're a very patient man. Like this, <laughs> the scene with little James, where uh, Jesus, yeah. you know, touched it. Uh, Matthew. Matthew touches so many people, as well as just humanizing Jesus, um, and that it's it's really created a conversation. And then people are joining in, in group watch groups with their friends that are are Catholic, aren't Catholic, aren't anything, and so it's a way to have, build on a conversation. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's so good. When people ask me if I've heard of The Chosen, I say, well, uh, do you like it? <laughs> so, it's a good follow-up yeah. question. <laughs> uh, there are people that don't like it, to be sure. Um, what? <laughs> We're on the internet. I'm just kidding. Where yeah, are we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, the uh, unity with distinction is nothing new. If you think about the 12 apostles that Jesus pulled together, right? We have Matthew, the sellout guy to the Romans, and we have Simon the Zealot, the guy who wants to kill all the Romans. And Jesus picks those two guys to be on the same team together. So this unity uh, it, it, with distinction, it, it, it's got a long history in the Christian faith. Um, but Sometimes some of those favorite distinctions are things we have to loosen up on yes. uh, in order to uh, enjoy the unity that Jesus is calling to. Yes. We all come from cultural backgrounds, uh, a wide variety of cultural backgrounds that God has blessed us with, but there's always something sinful in our cultural backgrounds, and we have to be willing to let Jesus speak to that yes. Uh, yes. in order to bring us into tighter unity. Yeah. So the unity with the distinction thing's been going on for about 2,000 years. <laughs> yeah, and, and one of the things in connection to this is we see in the chosen, you know, we see, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, and you see the characters praying the traditional Jewish prayers. And the most famous is Shema Yisrael Adonai Lehino Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or alone, you could say. And, you know, this idea of God being echad, God being one. And this is so important because, as we said, we, Jesus, John 17, Yeshua prays that these and those would be echad, one, as he and the Father are one. And then we read in... Zechariah 14, it says, On that day, the Lord will be one and his name will be one. So the question is, if God is one and we declare God is one, then why is God's name only going to be one on that day in the distant future when the kingdom is established on earth as it is in heaven? It's because God's name will not be one, meaning God's name will not be fully revealed and made manifest in the world, the full revelation of who he is and his heart, his character, his nature, 
will not fully be revealed into the world until we become one in Messiah. And this is Jesus, this is Yeshua's prayer. He says that they might be one, that you might be perfected in unity, and then the world will know the Father sent me. The world will not be W-O-N until we are O-N-E in Messiah. Right? And so, and it goes back, goes back to that unity and distinction because the first thing God calls to be one is the man and woman. Equal and equally valuable, yet distinct in nature. And so in heaven, every tribe, every tongue, every, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every nation brings something unique and distinct that reflects a different aspect of who the Lord is, like a multifaceted diamond. It's what brings the brilliance. And that's what's brilliant about the chosen in us here today because all of us together from our different backgrounds coming together reflect the nature of who he is and the true beauty of the gospel. Amen. Amen. So good. So good. Yeah, I feel like that's, in my perception, I feel like unity is an undervalued principle yes. in scripture. Like it's, it's, are we pursuing unity? at the same quest that we are other realities. And like Rabbi Sobel is saying, in that day, his name will be one. And we're, we're, are, we, are we going in that direction? I think it's also something we can tangibly do. So uh, to me, this is one of the things I love so much about The Chosen is that it's gathering the family. And it's it, like you say, it's gathering on the important aspects of who Yeshua is, who Jesus really is. And then the Jewishness of him, in my understanding, it it creates this like glue that helps unify the family. And like, that's just an amazing picture of, because there have been unity movements throughout the centuries, but for this first time in history, we live in this unique moment in history, where the, the Messianic Jewish movement has been rebirth, right? Israel's come back into her land, and now we have the, the resurrection, if you will, of the Messianic Jewish remnant that now allows the fullness, if you will, of this diverse family. I don't know if, Rabbi Jason, you have a comments about that. But. Yeah, I mean, I, there's just so many things, I mean, I think on the one hand, the danger is because of the fallenness of humanity, it, you know, sin creates separation. And so because of our fallenness, our first uh, inclination and our reality is to feel otherness and separation. I feel myself distinct and separate. That's the reality in the physical fallen world but that's not the reality from God's perspective in the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one people, and we are truly all one and truly all connected, preserving the bond of unity you know, and peace in the spirit. But, but, our, but because of that, we tend to see the otherness, the differences and the distinctions instead of seeing the deeper connections and what unites us and brings us together. And I think that's, it's easy to be a hater and look at the differences instead of the realities that we're far more similar and connected and family than we truly perceive. And I do think the restoration of the Messianic movement into this dialogue is, is so important because God wants to restore the fullness of his of his plan for humanity and there's a principle as it was in the beginning so will it be in the end so when you look at the the book of acts you see you have the you have you know the you have the jerusalem church which is the and you have the jewish apostles to the jews and peter right and then you and james and then you have antioch which represents mission to the nations when the when the jewish mission in the Gentile mission, Jerusalem and Antioch are working together, you see a great move of God. I think when you separate Jerusalem and Antioch, when you separate a Jew and Gentile, then you wind up with not the fullness of God's intention. Oh, and the book of Acts actually shows the first church struggling with this issue. 
uh, and they had those conversations and had to keep working on it, even as we need to keep working on it. Yeah, and, and, a, and a big thing you said, there's, there's been lots of unity movements, and to keep the main things the main things is so important, because we're rallying around Jesus. We're rallying around the Messiah. It's like our allegiance is to him. Our, our, all of our eggs are in his basket, right? And if we're rallying around other things, it's not gonna work. We're rallying around the gospel of the king. And, and that's even what is giving us the ability to be even right here, right now, is that we're rallying around the gospel of the king that, that is returning. Yeah, I, I believe we're in a John 21 moment. We have a new book out, Signed the Secrets of the Messiah. We talk about this. I believe that God wants to bring the greatest catch that the world has ever seen, hence the logo of the chosen. And the chosen is part of that. But I think God doesn't bring the catch until we prepare the container for the catch. Right. And the first time Peter cast the nets, his net broke when Jesus told him to cast the net again. John 21, the nets don't break. God wants to give us the nets that don't break. Yeah. The nets represent the network of relationships in the Lord that God is bringing together for this time and season. What happens though is too many times people think it's my net or my part of the net is most important. <laughs> the only, you have to understand you're only a piece of the net. Yep. And it's when we join our pieces yes. to each other, that's when the net is formed for what God wants to do. Historically, when unity movements or revivals it starts off great, and then someone says, well, my net should be the most important net. Right. <laughs> and then you break the net. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that question is just so important. And I think one of the things that The Chosen shows is that they all found their way to Jesus right away, but they're still learning what Jesus, who Jesus really is and what it really means to follow him. Right. That's and right. that's where the discernment comes in to yeah. say, Yes, we all want to be around Jesus. What does that mean? Yes. And that was the whole task of Acts and Easter, oh, is, is saying, well, what does it mean to follow the Christ yeah. yes. in this world, in this place, in this time that we're in? Amen. And But if we keep that as the core question, we'll do it. It's good. Good. If it's still it's focused on Christ. Yeah. You're right. The Chosen has done a great job of showing that. Which, you know, everybody came to him and then, then wow, they're still doing that? They're still <laughs> wrestling? And, you know, how you kind of relate to different characters right in different ways and i i love how they have presented again it's just this human journey yeah. uh to the lord and then you work out your your salvation with fear and trembling right yeah, it's called discipleship right you have to be discipled to be yeah. made more like him yeah, yeah. It's good. which takes lots of time and lots of effort and lots of help from other people yeah. well we just like have a minute or two left so we just want to Thank you guys so much for connecting us to this ecumenical Yeshua, this authentic Yeshua. Can we just give them a hand? Thank you so much. I'm going to get real sappy. I just feel, I, I personally, I just feel a lot of love for these guys. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just, I just feel like I feel the love of the Father for these men and say thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing with the children, but thank you for what you're doing in your ministries and, and yeah. discipling the nation. So right. thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And, and keep going. And thank you for your examples for this unity with distinction. Yeah. Uh, and then just as a, a parting, you know, when things back to unity and just what God is doing right now, when, when things are, are get heated, all of a sudden, we, we step into unity a little bit more, don't we? We care about each other a little bit more. And those things that don't matter as much, they kind of fall away. And so I know that so many people are asking us, I'm sure they're asking you uh, about what's going on in Israel. And I just want to exhort everyone to keep praying. Yes. Please keep praying. Pray for the salvation of Israel physically and spiritually. Yes. Uh, a few months back, there was this international, you know, 21 days of millions of people praying for the salvation of Israel. So I feel like the Lord wants to keep this momentum going. His eyes, his heart is on Jerusalem. It's on Israel, his covenantal land where he's coming back. So pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. 
Pray that he would set the captives free. This is so important. Like right now that we step into second commandment love. It's like practical theology. These are all theologians, but they would exhort you, beg you, that take that first commandment love and make it second commandment love. And pray and support Israel and the Jewish people right now. There's so many different ways you can also help. So just to exhort you to do that. And thank you all so much for coming. Yeah. God bless you guys. Bless you guys. All right, please lead us in prayer, Robert. I mean, you know what, Cana, we just want to lift up. It says, Shalom, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, God, for you. We say, Esa Enai, Ele Hari, Me Ayin Yavo Isri. We lift our eyes to the hills. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We pray, God, that you would be the ozer, that you would be the helper in the midst of this crisis. We pray that you would be the magen, that you would be the shield. We ask that you would shield every innocent Palestinian, that you would shield every innocent Israeli. We just want to pray, God, that those who have evil intentions, those that want to harm others, that you, God, would intervene. And we want to pray that in the midst of hate, that, that there would still be love. Yes. And we say, Ana Adonai Hoshiana. Ana Adonai Hoshiana. Lord, grant deliverance now. Ana Adonai Hatzlechana. Lord, grant success and victory now. And we pray this over Israel, over the Palestinian people, and over everyone in this room. Israel and the Palestinians and all of you. May the Lord lift up his countenance. May the Lord shine his face. May the Lord be gracious. And may the Lord grant shalom, yes. peace. Yes. Nothing missing, nothing broken. In the name of Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Yeshua, Meshechenu, Adonenu, Boreinu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Redeemer, our Creator. Amen. Amen. I thought you always wore a black t-shirt. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing gray today. Are you feeling okay? Um, I need to do laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine your closet like you open it up and it's ha on hangers, 25 black pocket t-shirts.